Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today. This session will be a look at some compliance FAQ topics and discussions presented by Special Projects Manager, Jennifer York. Thank you, Melissa. As Melissa said, my name is Jennifer York. I am the Special Projects Manager. I am currently based here in Wichita Falls, Texas. And I will be working with compliance training, lease up files, um, acquisition files, or any other special projects that get sent my way. Thank you all for joining us today for our first regional compliance talk. We really look forward to doing these um, monthly with a couple of different regions at a time. Anne and Tanae, I appreciate your time and thank you for letting us take a few minutes out of everyone's busy day. Today's topics were suggested by Anne and Tanae, and their suggestion was the timely submission of files. You cannot get an approval on to move someone in if the file is sitting on your desk. There's no, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Each and every application needs to be approached with a sense of urgency. Whether the application is for a currently vacant unit, an occupied unit that happens to be on notice, or even a recertification, a sense of urgency is vital to the timely completion of files. What does sense of urgency mean? Sense of urgency defined the quality or state of requiring immediate attention. People have a true sense of urgency when they think that action on critical issues is needed now and not eventually. So when you're working on an application, action is needed now, it never eventually. Now as in the context of making real progress every single day. So what does sense of urgency mean to you? Think about this. If anyone has a comment, a thought, a suggestion, please shoot it up there in the chat box. I would love to see it. Um, my favorite definition that I came across when, you know, kind of looking into things is acting with the realization that efficiency is vital to success. I don't think anyone can argue that. Efficiency is vital to success. Sense of urgency isn't just, you know, when you hear the word urgent, you think hurry, quick. That's part of it, obviously. But if you're not efficient in what you're doing, you are not going to be successful. Think of like the story of the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise was successful, not because he moved the fastest, it's because he made a plan, he stuck with his plan, and he continued moving forward. He minimized distractions, and he moved forward with a purpose nonstop. Efficiency, again, is vital to success. Melissa, during the um, new hire training, speaks to time management. And there's a couple of lines that I wanna borrow directly from what she has to say on that. Be clear about the response you need when sending messages to colleagues to prevent back and forth emails. Again, efficiency is vital to success. Another point that she makes, write down a quick agenda before making a phone call to help you keep on track. Moving forward with purpose, making a plan, making real progress every day. All of these thoughts, ideas need to be implemented when you are working a file using that sense of urgency. Now that you're kind of thinking that you would know what sense of urgency, how do we create sense of urgency in an applicant? Guys, this is leasing 101. Think about this. This isn't new information. This is simply a new application of the exact same information. First of all, limited supply. Always let the applicant know, hey, I only have a limited number of, of apartments available. 
This is my last three bedroom. If you are unable to return your information in a timely manner, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to move on to the next person. Limited time. Make sure your applicants know the compliance department policy of the timely submission of corrections. Um, say to them, you know, our policy is to request all information to be returned within 48 hours. 24 hours is even better. This would give you time to review it well prior to sending it to compliance. Um, when I, we used to own restaurants and when we, um, my husband and I, and when the waitresses were having a bad night or things were not going well, we always used the phrase, blame it on the kitchen. You know, as the front person, we would act, tell them, you know, put the blame back on the kitchen. You know, if you forgot to ring it in, don't worry about it. You know, put the blame on the kitchen. Kind of in the same way here, put the, put it back on compliance. Say they have a policy that requires a strict turnaround time on all applications. I need to get information to them as quickly as possible so that they may have an appropriate amount of time to review without delaying your move in. Sometimes it's hard for us to, as the frontline people, to set those deadlines and make our applicants follow through on them. Blame it on the kitchen, guys. Put it back on this is compliance's policy. I have to follow my corporate's policies and this is what it is. Make it personal to your applicant. Their delay in response to your request will postpone their move-in. Make them understand that they do have some control in this. You're the leader, you're in charge, but place some of that responsibility on them and encourage them to accept it. If you're working on a um, file, maybe it is on a um, unit that's just on notice. So this person's move-in date is way out. I know sometimes that can really be hard to get them to respond in a timely manner because they don't need to move until March. So why are they concerned about it? Still fall back on that same policy you know, fall back on the compliance requirement of 72 hours and move it from their move-in date to their approval. Your delay will, your delay in returning information will delay your approval date. And as we all know, in LIHTC, that approval is everything. You know, you cannot tell someone that they can move in without that approval. Last of all, added benefits. Sell your property, sell your location, sell your amenities. Make people, make sure you're making them want to move in quickly. Make sure you're pointing out all of the great stuff that makes them want to be at your property. And in all of that, make sure you're selling yourself. Selling yourself as the leader of this community. Also, you're beginning that process of setting expectations of their residency. So set expectations for them now. They're not gonna, I think we're afraid again, that they're, you know, we're gonna run people off if we set too many rules and regulations during the application process, but it is not true. If an applicant is not willing to follow directions, they're probably gonna be a resident who's not willing to follow directions. So don't be afraid to set those deadlines and encourage people to follow through. And I think you will find that they will. As you can see, all of this kind of works together. This wasn't a leasing presentation, but yet understanding that sense of urgency works with our leasing. It works with our um, file work of working on an application. Um, during the um, our shops, 
that's one of the specific questions. Did the leasing professional convey a sense of urgency? Understanding sense of urgency can go a long ways in all aspects of what you're doing on site. So now speaking to the sense of urgency and we understand that, we're getting our files completed timely, ready to submit. How do we ensure that we're receiving and passing on to compliance the best information that we can? Um, the quality of information submitted, I think you would all agree, that does have an impact on how long it takes for the file to be reviewed, approved, and um, the person moved in. So let's think about what are the most common corrections on an initial PFN? What are the two areas that create the majority of the corrections? Does anyone have a quick guess there in the chat? Where do most of our corrections come from? And this goes for new, um, new hires up to tenured managers. The areas that have the most corrections, very good Wedgwood, yes, application. The application and the screening, too much information in the application, yes, Brandon, I would agree with that. <laughs> um, those are the two areas, application and screening. Yes, Jerry. We are going to say those exact words momentarily. Jerry said, blanks not filled in, questions not answered. And that is a time killer. We're going to start with the application. How can we make sure we are providing the best application that we can? First of all, prepare your applicant before they ever even come to the office. When you make that appointment with them, do not say, please bring your current pay stubs. Ask them, how often are you paid? Okay, you're paid every other Friday. Please bring your four most current pay stubs. Make sure they are consecutive. The number of people who've asked me, what does consecutive mean? Like, it's crazy. So make sure that they understand and you are very clear exactly what you need. I need your four most current pay stubs, all of them in a row, don't skip any. Um, another way to be very specific, let them know, I don't need to see a copy of the kids' social security cards. However, you need to know the last four digits. If you don't want to bring them with you, please take a picture before you leave the house, write them down. Um, sometimes taking five extra minutes during that phone call to prepare them to come in will save two days of waiting for them to bring back the kids' social security numbers or come back to write those four numbers in. Kind of a little side note on this, and I don't know if, I would assume everyone has run into this to a degree with the current situation with COVID. Um, I have started trying to remember to ask people, have you been quarantined lately? Have you um, missed any time at work recently? Because I've had several applicants in a row that come in they, do, they did exactly as I asked. They brought their four most current consecutive pay stubs. But one of the pay stubs was for, you know, $1.22. And another one had all this sick time, vacation time. You know, they, there's, a lot, there's a lot going on with people right now. So I have started trying to remember to ask them, if they've had anything odd happening, and if, if so, go ahead and ask them to bring six or even eight current pay stubs. That way you can really get a good idea of what's going on with their, you know, with their income, and you'll have the information you need 
to submit and not have to call them back in again to bring you more pay stubs. This first point here to speak to that, sit down with your applicant. Sit down with them when at all possible to offer direction and answer questions. Review the application as they are filling it out. Don't make them guess what a question means. Um, like Brandon said, too much information in the application. It is a long application. Don't make them guess what any of those questions mean. You need to be familiar with your material in order to assist your applicants in the completion of the material. Slow down, slow down and read through the application while they are still in your office. Do not ever let someone leave before you have reviewed the information that they have filled out. I have even, when we have like, you know, maybe it's a roommate situation, so we have three or four people or, you know, a family with multiple children. So we're sitting in that outer area and it's kind of hubbub and, you know, a lot's going on. I've even gotten up and said, excuse me for a moment, let me go review this quickly. And I've walked away, gone into my office, shut the door, read through it with no disturbance so that I knew, okay, I still need this, this, and this. They didn't fill in this blank. Read through it before they leave your office. The most common corrections, as Jerry said, um, missing information, blanks not filled in, in like the housing references. That's where I personally miss them all the time is when they miss it, when they don't fill things in in the housing references. Um, if they've marked something yes, make sure they've filled in the explanation if that question requires it. If they've marked something yes, make sure that they've listed it on the application in the, in the um, follow through box. If it's an at or if it's income, they're going to answer, they're going to list it in section um, IVB or 4B. Make sure that that is filled in if the question is yes. Um, contradictory information. This is something I don't know. It, it's crazy to me how often this information like this happens. Um, so, one example I can think of is someone, a single person household, they mark never married, but then on their housing reference, they list the owner as Sue Jones, mother-in-law. Well, if you've never been married, how's that your mother-in-law? Um, or a boyfriend, girlfriend, they each fill out their own applications and he lists his mom, Sue Jones, as his emergency contact, and it says Sue Jones, relationship mother. She lists Sue Jones as her emergency contact, and it says Sue Jones, relationship mother-in-law. You're sitting in front of them. You've been listening to them. You realize that they simply, you know, have been together forever, and that's how they refer to one another, and that's how they're referring to, you know, the mother, the compliance doesn't realize that. So that, you know, stop and think, make sure nothing on this application contradicts something else. I wanna once again, refer back to the time management portion of Melissa's training. One of the other taglines she has in there, take the time to double check your work before sending it in. I cannot, there's no way that that can be stressed enough. It doesn't apply just to the application process, but also, you know, to your accounting, your month end accounting items, anything that you're sending into corporate, take time to double check it to save yourself time in the future. Our next big area of um, corrections is in the screening. Um, 
I, in speaking with Michelle the other night, this first slide speaks to entering, actually entering the applicant and doing the screening. She said this really wasn't an issue, except usually early on when someone is first learning. So we're gonna kind of go through this quickly. Most of this you guys all know, and you mostly just need to watch for miskeying. The number of times that an applicant's name is miskeyed is absolutely amazing. Select the correct applicant type. The scoring models differ re in regards to the required rent to income ratio. So in that top right hand corner, whether make sure you select the correct type, either applicant scoring model or housing or caregiver scoring model. Enter the name exactly as it appears on the state or federal issued photo ID. Exactly. If their middle name is spelled out, spell out their middle name. It doesn't matter how they wrote it on the application. You need to enter it as it appears on the state or federal issued ID. Using the photo ID, not the application, enter their date of birth and take that moment to double check that they've entered their date of birth correctly on the application. Using their social security card, not the application, enter their full social security number. Again, take that moment to make sure they have entered their last four digits correctly on the application. Do not enter the photo ID number or the issuing state. <clears throat> I thought it was funny, Michelle said, she actually admitted it. She said, if it's there, you know, compliance is gonna check it even if we tell them not to. So please stress to people, do not enter it. <laughs> it's not necessary for the screening. So please just completely ignore that photo ID number and issuing state box. Enter the applicant's current address from the application. Do not use the property address. If you use the property address and this person gets, like say they're denied um, or they change their mind, we don't go forward with the application, the next place they go and they have their background ran, it's going to pull your property address. It probably wouldn't matter most of the time, but it could create confusion because it's gonna show that they lived at your address when they didn't. So make sure you're using their current address from the application. Enter the full rent amount for the unit and designation that they have applied for. Even on housing applicants, do not break that rent down at all. Enter the full amount. And then lastly, make sure you're entering the total monthly household income. Use the house, use the application, add up all household members' income. There's three roommates, pull all three incomes. Enter that for their um, household income. So what is compliance looking for in a screening? On site property managers, you know, if you want to look at can they get um, um, electric in their name, there's, there's different things that are important to the property management side, and we understand that. But make sure you know what compliance is going to be looking at. Any name variances, if, um, and this, we tend to think mostly it's women because it does usually have to do with a maiden name or a previous married name, but don't assume that it's only on a female's application or screening that you're gonna see a last name variance. It could be anyone. If it's a maiden name, it simply requires a self affidavit. If it is a previously married name, then you need to determine, can I use a WPI um, divorce affidavit or do I actually need the divorce decree? Student loans, we're always looking for student loans. Tax credit has all of the cuckoo student rules. Um, 
you're always going to need an affidavit to include the following information. The date they last attended school, the name of the school they last attended, and be sure to get their intent. Because everything in tax credit, we're looking at the next 12 months. We're projecting their income over the next 12 months. So what is their intent regarding school in the next 12 months? On occasion, you are going to have to get an actual verification of the last date attended. It kind of depends on the circumstances. Two times that you're al almost always going to need actual verification is if the applicant is 18 or 19 years old, we're gonna need to see when did they typically graduate high school. Like that's usually kind of the thought process. Um, easiest thing for that is if they happen to have their diploma handy. That's a very easy, just open it up, copy it on your copier and send that in. They're still going to need to do the affidavit because we need to know their intent for the next 12 months. Um, or if in the affidavit, the applicant happens to state that they attended school in the current calendar year or the last 12 months, then we're gonna want a um, verification from wherever they attended showing their last date enrolled. Mortgages. That's a big thing that compliance is looking at. Um, if they still own the property, please immediately look at the real estate um, portion of the asset section in com the compliance manual. That's what you're gonna have to follow. This is more we're going to address if they no longer own the property. We're gonna need an affidavit. You want the exact address that this mortgage was tied to. What happened to it? Did they sell it? Was it foreclosed? Did they give it away, sign it over to one of their kids? What happened to it? And what was done with the profits if it was sold? And when? When did this take place? We're asking the when question because we're looking for a disposed of asset for less than fair market value. So if it was within the last two years, you're gonna need to get the fair market value from the assessor, as well as whatever legal documentation was executed to transfer the ownership. Okay, next thing, I think we all kind of know this one, the balance is owed to a current or previous landlord. Um, we aren't concerned, obviously, if someone has, has evictions on their credit. We only care if they still owe money. So if a current or previous landlord is listed with a zero balance, nothing is needed. If a current or previous landlord is listed with any amount owed, they are going to have to provide documentation of the debt paid in full. Um, this references referring back in the compliance manual for more detail on acceptable documentation. Hopefully they, you know, we can just get a ledger or something from the other property. That's the easiest and you can move on or a letter from the, um, if it had gone to collections, a letter from the um, collection agency showing that they have fulfilled any payment due. And um, always look as well at the, um, the real page reporting area, because it may not be in the body of the credit. You may just see amounts owed <clears throat> in that real page reporting area. And typically, a lot of times those are gonna be more regarding a current landlord. So it could just be that, um, the rent hadn't posted yet, or maybe you know their water bill is added to their rent, and that could be all it is, and you can get a current ledger from the current landlord for that. 
Um, Rachel has a really good question. Why don't we check prior landlord references? That would be something to ask on the property management side. I'm honestly not sure we used to. Um, and I don't know if my thought would be, and this is just me giving a thought, that it has more to do with, um, we wanna simplify the process. Um, if we just go off the screening, we're looking at do they owe money or not? And it's kind of a, let's give everyone a second chance type thing. Um, but I don't know if Ann or Tanae, either one are on here, maybe they can weigh in and um, let us know what their thoughts are on not checking landlord references. Oh, good one, Carrie. Landlords were not always honest. They gave good references just to get them out. Isn't that tempting? Not gonna lie, guys, right? Isn't that tempting? With <laughs> I had someone call the other day on um, a resident that I've given a notice to vacate to, and it was everything in me. And I, I was honest. I gave him, you know, I told him the truth, but it was hard because I want her to find a place because I don't want to have to fight with her. Um, I don't want to have to go to court. You know, I just hope that she finds some place and moves on. Um, and absolutely correct, Brandon, fair housing issues. Um, so much is, t it's subjective. Um, that the one I was just referring to, my current resident, um, I actually told him, I said, do you have a form you could just send me that I could fill out? Because the way he was asking questions, I'm like, I, I wasn't comfortable answering. Um, so the last time, you know, when you were in her apartment, what kind of condition was it in? What did it look like? And I'm just like, no, you need to have a, are there housekeeping issues or, you know, um, Brandon's very correct. It's very subjective. And um, I always fall back on if I've given them a lease violation for housekeeping, that's the only time you would mention a housekeeping issue. I don't know, but he's correct. It's too subjective and we were not always getting good information, according to Carrie. Thank you guys for that help there. Okay, recreational loans on the screening. Um, the biggest thing is finding out what that recreational loan is for because if it is a bass boat, you need to find out where they're gonna park it. That's, I mean, that is the biggest reason for questioning things like that is where are they going to leave this because they're not parking, parking it in our parking lot and timeshares. Timeshares are an asset. You can find out more information in the real estate section, but they are an asset. They can be sold sometimes for a profit. Sometimes you end up just having to give them back, but we have to ask more questions. We can't just ignore them or assume that there would not be a profit made or that there's no dollar value to them. And then lastly, government repayments. If your current resident or current applicant, I'm sorry, has Social Security, SSI, or VA benefits listed as income to their household, we don't need anything further. Those are all government payments, so it is very understandable that there may be a government repayment on their credit. If they do not list any of those items, you should question it. It could lead to some undisclosed income. Okay, I am prepped and ready for questions. I hope we have some. I hope this was beneficial. Um, our biggest emphasis obviously today was in the timely submission of files and what can we do to speed that 
um, speed that up, make that more um, efficient. And then obviously the timely submission of files can also lead us to um, the number of corrections. The more corrections we are we have, it doesn't really matter how quickly we get the file to them if we're not, again, reviewing our work, being more efficient, and um, submitting the best information that we can. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, well, if we don't have any questions, um, I want to thank everybody for being here. And if you come up with, if you have um, thoughts on future um, webinars, trainings that you would like to see, um, please let Melissa or I know um, the compliance department is working on some very um, deep detailed um, webinars and um, we're always open for suggestions. We don't want to talk about things that y'all don't want to hear about. <laughs> okay, Melissa, I am going to turn it over to you. Just <laughs> yes, thank I you, mean, Melissa. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Jennifer York. I appreciate all that you did in uh, offering this enrichment training. I definitely learned and um, was refreshed on the ideals in in creating urgency when you're working in those packets. Um, some great tips on that. And uh, looking at those screenings, there's so many details in that. Thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you everyone for making time to attend today's training. We will, um, I, I did record it, so I will save the recording and try to make it available on ERP in the next few days. Have a great rest of your day and rest of your week, guys. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>